above me is perhaps one of the most divisive walls in the world, the wall that separates Palestine from Israel. There is no Palestinian prisoner that leaves the jail healthy. A lot of them die immediately after leaving the, the jail. Are they, are they watching us now? Nothing lasts forever, man, especially injustice. No, Salah wants to take me to the ghost town. And he told me to get ready because there the stories will be even more intense. My name is Giuseppe and I have a mission. To travel the world, to meet the most extraordinary people on the planet and to ask them a simple question. What does happiness mean to you? Welcome to Project Happiness. This is a road right in the middle of the West Bank, connecting uh, Bethlehem with Hebron. But at the same time, it's full of Israeli soldiers. Fuck, man. Look at that. It's like the Israeli soldiers are on every single corner. So wherever you go, Israel wants to control your life. Like these, these guys in the tower there yeah. are like gods, you know? They can say this die, this lives, this die, this lives. And that's what happens all the time. I was pretty shocked by the the stories of Ali. Yeah. But what it makes me even shocker is that Ali is one. And I'm sure that if we stop another person, another friend of you... That's a very common... It would be the same. ...story, man. So, yeah. You know, a huge amount of Palestinians went to jail. It's like... If I remember well, it's at least one out of five people went to jail. What happened to your hand? Is there anything uh, related to...? Yep. It's an Israeli bomb, man. What happened? We were kids, we were playing football and I found a toy picked it up, it went off in my hand. Because it was a bomb? Yeah. Planted inside a tennis ball. In Palestine, generally in Hebron especially, you can walk normally and see something very weird like that, you know, very strange, like stairs and a window. This is the actual entrance of a house for normal people. This is a door? It's a window acting as a door. Why? Because the other side where the doors are is occupied by Israel. And people cannot, are not allowed by Israeli military to use their houses normally. That's why they need to go in and out using a window. Uh, this is the center of the old town of uh, Hebron. Uh, the checkpoint is a spin door. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a way to control people's life, going in and out. We, we might need to be a little bit careful with filming. Yeah. Whatever they say, we're just tourists. And... Maybe they will stop us, check everything. So keep the camera low. Yeah. Where Sorry? Where are you from? I'm from Bethlehem and they're from Italy. Yeah. From Italy? Coming in. Yes. Uh, are you Christian? How many yes. people are you? Just try. That's what you told me. They asked us if they, we, we were Christian. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the safest answer is to say you're Christian, basically, yeah. even if you're not. Because uh, if you say, I'm not a religious person, I don't have a religion, then they will say, like, why? What, what do you mean you don't have a religion? Or if you say Muslim, they would say, you cannot go there, yeah. to the other side. If you say you're Jewish, you, you, they would say, you're not going to this side. <laughs> They're controlling all the means of life of people in this area here. Come in, let's walk towards uh, one of the checkpoints down there. Yeah. Walking around in Hebron is, is so stressful, man. Every time I come back, I come, I come to Hebron, I go back. <laughs> with lots of stress, Yeah. seriously. Lots of bad memories. Um. It is. Look at this house. Definitely it wasn't here when you came here last. This house has been occupied recently and they turned it into a settlement. Now it's the only house that is under renovation because they're renovating the house to make it as a settlement. Yeah. Mm. 
building up a little bit more the house next to it, which is used by Palestinians still. They're not allowed to fix anything. We are about to pass another checkpoint within the city. How many checkpoints there are in the, in the city? Because over two dozens in Hebron, I think like 20, 24 checkpoints. To go from one neighborhood to another, you have to go through checkpoints. Here's another one now. Hi. Morning. Can we go in? Can we go in? Uh, uh, sure. Uh, you mean permit? Permission? I don't have permit. I have uh, ID card. Salah actually could not enter the ghost town. Uh, Palestinian. Palestinian. So one, two can go in, and I can't. Okay. I'll I'll wait for you here. Okay. All right. Go go. On. Stay, Stay safe. Bye. So? Well, they didn't let Salah in. Uh, we can enter the ghost town without him because he was not allowed to. As they entered from here, all the people who entered were settlers. People who are occupying this area. It's a shame he couldn't come in, he could have explained everything we were seeing. Now we'll see the desolation of the ghost town. There are areas where there is no one left because everyone had to leave. You know, the soldiers are very young. Because in Israel, I think, as soon as you turn 18, you have to do three years of compulsory military service. Three years for men and 18 months for women. In my world travels, I've met so many young guys seeking relaxation after finishing military service. You can see all of the soldiers are so young. Sometimes this is actually a problem. Because being so young, they lose their cool in combat and make grave mistakes that cost people their lives. There are soldiers everywhere. Everyone is armed here. Even the ones who look like civilians. Hello. Hello. No No picture. No picture. Jewish shall no picture to Jewish. No picture Jewish. No picture Jewish. No picture Jewish. Okay. Okay. No picture Jewish. Si ha fermati un soldato. We were stopped by a soldier saying we can't film the settlers here. I settlers qui? And I expected that honestly. Surely they don't want to be filmed. Io sono venuto qui. I came here on my first world tour. And it had really left an impression on me. I saw boys my age jogging with machine guns. And that I can never forget. That's why I told Salah to take me back to Hebron. If we want to document what's going on here, I want to show Hebron, which in my opinion is the symbol of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And so here I am, again. I'm sorry he's not here though. Everything was empty. Yeah. There was no one. All the houses were yes. abandoned. Yes. Yes. But they're they're building new settlements inside. I don't know if you noticed it. They're changing the city, trying to uh, interfere in, into everything. And this is a UNESCO site. The whole old city is a UNESCO International Cultural Heritage Site. But they're they're not respecting that. They don't respect UNESCO. They don't respect. Today, uh, settlers who live in Hebron get all the support from the government. They get money, they get free education, they get everything just to stay here. So their job is uh, 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 being a settler and that's why they would move them from one house to another, to another, to another. Every time they occupy a house, so you can see the same family coming from this one, going into that one, leaving to the third one. 
The bus you just saw passing is an Israeli bus. A bus that is only Israeli Jews can use. Okay, in this area here, it passes through all the neighborhoods. Palestinians, locals, cannot use it. They cannot go from A to B using it. It crosses a lot of the areas in the West Bank before going to Jerusalem. But no, we cannot use it because it's an apartheid system. Settlers here have the upper hand. They have the power. And that's why they do not allow the Israeli soldiers allowing the Palestinians going back to the houses and to the shops in that street. More than 1,500 shops are abandoned there by force. The, the whole area, it's not just the street is a ghost town. The whole area, half of it is turning into a ghost town because the number of the population in Hebron went down from 40,000 to less than 20,000 today. Israeli settlers are a couple of hundreds. They're like three, four hundreds, maybe five hundreds in best cases with thousands of soldiers to protect them. Why is that? Simply because they're not in the right place. Simply because they're here working as settlers. They're here trying to force themselves in the place. If you are not welcomed in a land you stole, you grabbed, you feel afraid. They bring here kids. I feel sorry for all of these soldier kids. They're kids. They come out from here brainwashed totally that everybody hates them. Of course they're going to receive hate if they are imposing occupation. Nobody would want to live in an area, if he's normal, that is full of, full of uh, 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 fight and full of aggressiveness and full of hate unless they need to. And that's why the price in the settlements, the price of a house in the settlement is very cheap comparing to the price of the houses in Israel. Adding to that all the economical uh, uh, benefits they get, especially in Hebron, for example, nobody pays a rent. Nobody uh, pays anything. They get mi uh, uh, military support they get medical support free, they get, they get medical education support for free, they get pensions and salaries to live here. They get the, all of that from either directly or indirectly from the Israeli government, either by the government directly or by organizations supported by the government. So, who creates settlers? The government. The government claims that they don't support it or some of that is illegal or whatever, but no. Every time there is a new illegal settlement, settlement going up, first thing the Israeli government does is that sending Israeli soldiers to protect it. Yeah, it's illegal, but we protect our civil citizens. Of course, protect them, but take them home. Don't keep them here. It's beautiful. It is, man. You know, if you look at that stone there and this stone here, those two stones actually describes the Palestinian reality, describes the people way of living. That is a stone from when the mosque was uh, uh, turned into a mosque. It was built from the ruins to become a mosque. And that's when the mosque was turned into a church. Basically, the people kept these two stones to remind everybody that this is an important place of worship, of happiness, a place where people could remember that this is an important place for everybody. Let's pray and be together in that memory, in that idea of coexisting instead of fighting over the place. Let's try to get, a, get, a, get, get it up out of the rubble, out of the pain, out of the sadness and all of that. Hopefully people would learn one day how to get back to that and to survive together, to live together, to be happy together. And if I would ask you, what is the happiness formula for you? You know, happiness is the ultimate uh, power of choice. If you are a person who cannot choose even if you are the richest person in the world and you sit in one place and if there's some power, some person, somebody, some office decides what you can eat, what you can drink, where you can go, what you can do, you're not going to be happy. Even if you have everything, 
still you're not happy because you cannot choose whether to eat eggs or hummus in the morning, whether to uh, 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 visit the sea or to go up in the mountain. Being free to choose is what makes me really happy. Freedom of choice, which unfortunately every Palestinian is derived that right. We cannot choose. We cannot, we're not free to choose. And do you think this will be possible in the future? I believe it is possible. And if we don't believe it's possible, it's never going to happen. You know, you need to, to believe in something very strongly for it to happen. Maybe not for me, maybe for my son. But yeah. And then your son will be happy. really happy. Yes. He, remem he, he will remember my words. I'll tell him that. He will see the, the video. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I came to Palestine to ask, as always, what happiness means in a place like this. But after the day in Hebron, I realized that here you can't really ask yourself whether you are happy, let alone dream, because there isn't even the time to have hope or a dream to be nurtured. Consumed with monitoring their feelings of alertness, of fear, and of feeling controlled and observed. There is nothing the Palestinians can do except what they are already doing, resisting and fighting. I always try to be a neutral reporter, showing you a postcard of what is really happening, but it's hard not to take sides when you see some things with your own eyes. Palestinians are often portrayed by the media as dangerous terrorists, but I have to ask myself how I would react if I were to be deprived of my home and my freedom. Around me I see only people, and I wonder, is peaceful coexistence really not possible? Perhaps this is not just an issue of cultural differences, but rather one of financial gain and racism. And change cannot happen spontaneously, as if to say, one day all of this conflict will end. Everyone must invest a lot of effort. That means governments, even our own people, and especially the media because there has to be an end to such oppression and violation of human rights. 